Good morning. Thank you, Jerry. We're going to go back to a song this morning. We haven't sung for quite a while, so maybe a little getting, getting back into it, but we're going to ask that you would stand as we begin our worship, singing, uh, worship service singing to our God of this city. Be done in this city. 
You may be seated. And welcome to the Hibbing Alliance Church. If you're a guest with us today, or you are one who attends as part of this family, we welcome you. We're here to prayerfully build relationships, impact lives with the transforming power of Christ for the growth of God's kingdom. Just a couple of announcements for you as the ushers come forward to receive our Lord's tithes and offerings. Vacation Bible School, if you haven't guessed it, begins tonight. And it's at uh, 445. Uh, we're asking people to get here at 5 o'clock. Supper will be served, and then after that will be the program itself. And if uh, it's not too late for people to register, so if you have a uh, nephew or a niece or a grandchild or a child that would like to be part of Bible school, you bring them tonight early so that they can register, and then bring them each night at 445 through Thursday evening. By the way, I just want to make mention and thank the people who have been putting all of this together and preparing for Bible school. My biggest fear is that they are worn out. And now the kids are coming. And so be praying for them because there's a lot of activity that's going to happen during the course of this week. And they have been putting hours and hours and hours. I drove by the church over on First Avenue and kind of peeked at the parking lot, hoping that our people were ready and they had a day to rest. And they didn't. And so uh, they, are, they have been just burning the midnight oil, getting ready for these children to come so that we can prayerfully build relationships with them, introduce them to Christ, see Christ transform their lives, and to build the kingdom of God. And so please be in prayer for those leaders as well as the children this week for Bible school. Uh, and I'm not even sure. I guess it's a long, I didn't ask, but is there any needs still in Bible school? Gloria, are you here? Or Lorinda, do you have any last-minute needs? think you're good. That's great. I think you're good too. And I appreciate you guys very much. Yeah, amen. And then there's announcements in there about uh, one of the, the, the missions offering this, this uh, Bible school is going to Syrian refugees. And so please read that information about that so that you can uh, help in that regard. And then also, if you haven't signed up yet, um, for the church pictorial directory, we would love to have everyone that calls this their church to be in that directory. Now, if for some reason uh, you don't want a picture, um, we'll respect that. But if we could just have your name and your address so we know that we have contacts for you, uh, this is all secured on, um, and, and the way that we're doing it. So we're not going to be pushing this out into the, into the neighborhood and saying, hey, we've got all these addresses you can contact now and sell them stuff. This is not the way this is going to work. This is for in-house, and so we'd love everybody who's a part of our congregation to participate in one form or another. Of course, my personal preference is that you would have pictures in there, but that is up to you whether or not you're going to, you're going to do that. You are not obligated, by the way, to purchase any pictures. They will ask. The photographer will ask, and you will get a free picture for your family. Uh, but obviously, they're going to say, aren't these nice, and they're going to rely on your affections for your families that go, these are great, you know, and, and then they, that's how they make their money. So um, you're not obligated to purchase those pictures, but we'd love to have you take the picture so it gets in the, in the directory. Other announcements are in your bulletin. Uh, there is a thank you there for the meet and greet. That went extremely well. Thank you for all who have participated in that and giving and, and participating and being there. Uh, it's great to meet our neighbors, and you uh, had a great part in that. Yeah, you can give yourselves a hand for that, too. That was great. All right, as we go to prayer this morning, um, I want you to remember uh, probably the ones that are most on my mind right now are Earl and Shirley Sonnenberg. They're both going through some serious health issues. Earl had a port put in, and he's going to go through an dialysis and those kind of things. He's supposed to come home tomorrow. Shirley is uh, not doing well and wanted to come today, but health prevented that from happening. So we want to pray for the Sonnenbergs. But also, um, um, we want to pray for our world. If you've been keeping up with the news at all, it is like the gates of hell have unleashed on humanity. And we have uh, death and destruction all over the globe in a prior higher intensity than I've seen it for a while. I never thought in my lifetime that we would see a repeat of genocidal attacks like happened with Nazi Germany to the Jews. And it's, it's out there. And we have a group of people out there that want world domination. And uh, we need to pray because militaries can stop the violence, but we can't stop. Uh, militaries can't change the intent. They can't change the character. That only comes by a powerful God. 
So as we go to prayer, let's pray for the peace of Jerusalem, the peace of the world, and that our, our, our leaders who are in, quote-unquote, uh, more stable environments and stable nations will uh, have the wisdom of God of what to do and how to handle this crisis around the globe. Let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, you are the God of this city and the God of this world. I have no doubt in that. Lord, probably it is more prevalent right now in the world, especially those who are under attack for their faith in Christ. There are people that are under attack because they don't believe a certain way in which their own faith believes. Father, there is a, a brutality that's happening in the world. And we sometimes hear people say, and maybe even wondered ourselves, where are you, God, in the midst of this? But God, you are in control. Jesus told us that we would, if, if the world hates us, don't be surprised because they hated him first. Lord, at some point, we need to bow before the cross. Not just casually, as acquaintances or buddies and friends, but truly in humility before an awesome, omnipotent, omniscient, holy God and cry unto you for deliverance. And we need that. We need to be doing that right now. Father, we pray for the brothers and sisters in Christ in Iraq and Syria and other parts of the Middle East where their children are being brutalized and killed, where families are being exterminated, where they're running into the mountains and dying of starvation and dehydration. Father, I pray that you will do a mighty miracle and a mighty work and stop this evil in its tracks. Help us, Lord Jesus, as a, as a people of God, those of us that have a relationship with you, to pray diligently and faithfully to you, O Father, on behalf of others. Help the nations that once were considered to be Christian or godly nations that have moved away from that and are walking in immorality and in treating you as a byword or just some kind of political word to use when it's appropriate. That we would repent and seek your face and turn from our wicked ways so that you will heal our land. Lord, I pray for our international workers in the Christian and Missionary Alliance and the, the, the Christian and Missionary Alliance churches who we are brothers and sisters with and we have them in Iraq, and we have them, Lord Jesus, in these Middle Eastern countries, and they are being attacked as well. And we pray, God, your protection over them. Father, we pray for protection, for healing on the assault of the body. And I think of Earl and Shirley, and Lord, they are just one couple, and there are many, Lord, are going through difficulty and physical needs. But Lord, I claim in Jesus' name a power upon them that is beyond that of doctors and medicines and techniques. But Jesus Christ, our healer, I pray for healing for these individuals. And others like them, Lord Jesus, that are listed in our bulletin. Lord, those that are, that are suffering from an emotional or a grief. Father, we are in a world that is bombarded and deluged with all kinds of misery. And today we're going to approach the subject, start the subject of who is God. And Lord, so many people are blaming you for these evils and so many people are, don't understand who you are and so many people are confused about who you are. And Father, I do not have the capacity, no one does, to truly explain who God is, but the Holy Spirit can. And so I call upon your spirit to open our minds to understanding and to understand the truth of God's word. As we sing these songs this morning about the glory and the power and the person of God, I pray, Lord, will come from the depths of our soul and that you will give us understanding beyond our measure. 
be blessed as we worship you in spirit and truth and be honored as we worship you in the giving of our tithes and offerings and the giving of ourselves this morning. I pray in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
thank you. Our God, you do reign. Lord, the world may be at war with each other and the evil may be encroaching upon us, but God, you are still in control. Father God, you are sovereign and you are just and you are holy and you are loving and we don't understand why you don't intervene in certain circumstances. But we know, Father, that at some point you'll say enough and Jesus will come. And the end, Lord Jesus, of this world as we know it will arrive and the Christ will take up the throne. Father, help us at this moment, before that happens, to be a light of the gospel to not sit back and hold inside, God, the glory of God and the salvation and hope it's found in Christ alone. Jesus, may we be a servant to the living God and raise up the name of Christ and bless the nations by sharing Christ with all. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. You may be seated. This morning, we're going to begin and embark upon a series. I'll tell you a little bit how this came about. I had a conversation with a relative. We were talking about spiritual things. And I asked him the question, is Jesus God? The answer I received to this simple question being that we grew up together in the same household, started me on a journey of pondering. On the way down to Wild Mountain, that was a youth event with Pastor Luke, who is at drill, by the way, that's why he's not here, he's at the Marine Reserve training. Um, I was driving and Kate was in the car, uh, vehicle, so I asked her, why don't you pick the songs for this Sunday, because that was on a Wednesday and... Darcy needed them pretty quick, and I hadn't done it yet. Her song choices became unintentionally thematic and increased the ponderings from that question with my brother. And as the sermon developed, it increased in content. So today he launches a mini series called Who is God? Today is just an introduction, and basically we're going to talk about who he isn't. <laughs> but as I mentioned earlier before prayer, we have missionaries that uh, have contracted the Ebola virus. Not from the Alliance, but we're people that serve the Lord Jesus Christ. We have African school of girls that were abducted to be sold into slavery in our world. We got Israel being rocketed by a terrorist group called Hamas. And the world is asking Israel to show restraint. Go figure. And we have a group now in the midst of the Syrian civil war that has claimed portions of Syria and Iraq uh, we call, it's called the ISIR, the Islamic State of Syria and Iraq, or IC. And they believe that there is only one true Allah. And it doesn't matter if you're Muslim or if you're Christian or any other brand, if you do not believe in that particular strain of Allah, then either you convert or you die. And I do not recommend that you search too heavy on pictures of the brutality because uh, I, haven't, I haven't really searched. And they are beheading people and putting their heads on spikes in parks. And they don't reserve that just for the adults. It is a brutal, violent evil that has been unleashed. And so those that are not confident in their faith or understand really the power and the person of God, the, the odd thing is, is then they begin to blame the one who can save people from their sins and say, this is God's fault. The other day there was a post by a different relative and, and the movie from the books left behind, the, the, new, the movie... Left Behind is coming out in theaters pretty soon. And uh, so the, there was a trailer of this movie. It looked pretty good, actually. And underneath it, this relative posted, I don't believe in pre-trib or mid-trib or post-trib. I think, well, what do you believe in then? If you don't believe that we're being raptured, and then I read a little bit of what he believe based on what somebody else believed and I'm supposed to go to see this other pieces, person's blog to understand what they believe in and I tell you what I was so angry and frustrated at that moment I said I am not going to go into the 
garbage pit and get all stinky just because this relative said he doesn't believe in the eschatology as we know it. Basically, when you see these pictures, and you, if you know what happens in Revelation, you know that at the rapture, all believers, poof, they're gone in the twinkling of an eye. And so what will that do to the world around us if a, if a Christian pilot disappears, if a car, person behind a car disappears, if a person in a ship disappears, if, if people all of a sudden just are gone, millions, gone, what's that going to do to society's stability? And the whole process behind this, I don't believe in the pre-trib, mid-trib, whatever, is a God of love would never allow that kind of tragedy to take place. And that comes from a branch of evangelical thinking. So here I am going to try to explain to you who God is. And I can tell you this, I know he exists. I know because he has changed me and transformed me and made me complete in him. I have still things to deal with and that's why the Holy Spirit's there. We'll be talking more about God and more about the Trinity and, and trying to understand all those complexities of who God is. Listen, you and I both, we talk about God, those of our belie uh, believers, we take, uh, I might be careful in saying it this way, but we kind of take for granted who God is. Yes, I love God. Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. We are so acquainted, so familiar with God and the concept of God, we have lost the fear of God. My son and I were talking, my oldest son, who's a pastor. He said he had heard a sermon not too long ago about, about a guy that talked about the fear of God. He said, read the Old Testament when it talks about they feared God. They didn't fear him in like, like I hope he doesn't do anything bad today. They feared the wrath of God. They did not want to come under the wrath of God. It's a wholesome fear. <coughs> I used to explain it. Excuse me. I used to explain it as though uh, the fear of fire. We all fear fire. What it can do to us. But yet we have been able to capture heat, to heat our homes, to cook our food. We have a respect for it. Um... But we really don't fear it anymore, do we? When you turn on your oven, you go, <laughs> no, you poof, poof, to put the pots and pans, do your cooking. When you go to have a Shemores campfire, you don't stand like 40 feet away from the fire, like, I don't know, that thing might get me. We don't fear it, we respect it. And we're supposed to respect God, but we're also supposed to fear God. And I want that to gel this week as we talk about who God isn't because it's not a, it's not a fear like God's, you know, God's going to whack me now. Every time I turn around, I'm fear that God's going to whack me. It's not fearing, the, it's not fearing that God's going to be unjust. It's not fearing that God is going to take me out because I said a bad word or I had a bad thought. But it's fearing God because He is omni presence, everywhere present. He is omniscient. He is all-knowing. He is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. There is no one in this world, not one single person, there is no one in his creation, not even the devil himself, that carries a candlestick to the power and the person and the presence of God. He is infinite. We are finite. I want to start with that so we understand, we start with a respect and a fear and an admiration and a glory for God. Not an acquaintance and not a buddy. I know we sing songs in the past, what a friend we have in Jesus. And I'm glad he's our friend. But he's not a friend like you and I are friends. He is more than that. He is the creator, the sovereign God the ruler, and I am to respect him and love him as master. So let's look at who is God. 
First of all, without him there is no us. Oops, sorry about that. In Genesis 1.1, the very first verse in the Bible, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The scriptures at the very, the very get-go want to establish it is all about God. You and I exist because of God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Everything around us is because of God. All the beautiful stars in the sky is because of God. The water that we drink is because of God. The gravity that holds us on the planet Earth is because of God. The job that you have and I have is because of God. The family that we have is because of God. The goodness that we have is because of God. It is God and God alone that has given us all these things that we love and possess. God is and God alone. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It is an Old Testament truth. And it is a New Testament truth. In the book of John, chapter 1, it says this, St. John, In the beginning was the Word. Capital W there, meaning we're referring to a person. In this case, we're referring to the person of Jesus Christ. So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and life was the light of men. That means what? That God, in the form of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three distinct personalities, and one defined D -d 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 divine essence. Not three gods in one, but one God, three distinct personalities. And I, I could spend a whole week trying to explain that to you and not understand it myself. It, that is a by faith thing. Nowhere in the Bible do we read the word Trinity, but Trinity means three in one. And you go back to the book of Genesis and you look in chapter 2 and it said the Spirit of God moves across the face of the water. Well, the Spirit of God, okay, there now we know there's the Holy Spirit is present at that time. And it says in chapter 2 or chapter 3 that the, God created man in our image. Well, our? Who's our? The triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Without him, there is no us. And I realize that when we read about Jesus, because of our finite abilities and thinking, we always think of Jesus, the baby that was born in the manger. And he was, and he is the Son of God, and he is the Son of Man, but he existed before that birth. And so he was there at creation. That's what John 1 tells us. Without him, there were nothing. So without God, God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, there would be no us. Without Him, there is no hope. It didn't take long in the book of Genesis for mankind to run off on their own and try to do things their own way. You remember that God put in the Garden of Eden one tree. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. One tree. He said, you know what? Adam, Eve, all this stuff is yours. You're going you're gonna to pick the fruit and you're going to name the animals. You've got a job to do. But you have access to everything in this garden. There's only one thing you don't touch. You don't eat. And that is the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Because the day you do that, the day you eat from that, you're going to die. One thing, one option. There was no evil in the world. There was no sin in the world at that point. There was only one, one thing that they could do to mess it up. One thing. 
They could eat any fruit they want. They could, they could do all the stuff. They could ride camels and horses and elephants, and they were friends, and they named them. They had all this glory around them. They walked daily in the presence of God. There's only one thing you're not supposed to do. One. There was no Ten Commandments. There was only one. And the heart of man and woman was to violate that one. Because I want to be like God. I don't want to worship him. I want to be on his level. And so Adam and Eve took of the fruit and a curse came into the world. Notice, if you will, in Genesis chapter 3. We didn't get very far in Genesis when all of a sudden everything fell apart. But in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15... God now is explaining the judgment to Adam and Eve for their sin. And he says in verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman. He's talking to the serpent. He said, I'll put enmity between you and the woman. You want, you, you, you want to know if there's enmity between people and snakes? Or, you know, uh, the other day somebody posted, and it was somebody on Proctor Street and Highway 10 in Elk River had caught a timber rattler snake. Now, Minnesota has rattlesnakes. They're down in the lower southwest corner of the state. They're just a little corner down there where we have timber rattlers. They're not supposed to migrate north. But here on Facebook is a picture. Of, and you can hear the rattle going. The guy says, I caught this right in the corner of Highway 10. And people are posting, like the, the world's coming to an end. Oh, I wish you would have told me that. Oh, no, I can't go outside anymore. I'm thinking... Well, what if it was like just got away from someone's aquarium? You know, you don't know. It's one snake. But people don't like snakes because of this. Because it was the snake that did the deception, Satan, in the form of a snake. He says, I'm going to put a, a between your seed and her seed. And, but listen, there's an allegory here. There's a prophecy here in this. He says, and he shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Look at the he. He, capital H. What does it mean when there's a capital in the middle of a sentence? It's referring to a person. Who's he? What God has done is already set up a structure. He, Jesus, shall bruise the snake on the head. In other words, he will step on Satan, the one that has caused this evil. But Satan, the other one, shall bruise him on the heel. What does that mean? It means that Christ will be put to death by the evil of Satan. There is, there is already a prophecy that begins saying, I'm going to give you hope and promise for the future. You're not going to live in this separation in relationship with God. There will be salvation. Established it in Galatians or in Genesis chapter 3 at the very beginning. There was a curse and a promise. Then there's a blessing for the future in Genesis the 17th chapter, verses 1 through 4. It says, Now when this, this is dealing with Abraham. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall you be named, your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, and I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. Here's, here's the beginning, the covenant that God has established. He's set up the people of Israel. They haven't been started yet. Abraham's the father. He will be the father. But he's saying, I'm setting up this covenant now for the salvation of the world. This is the blessing for the future. And by the way, Abraham stepped out of God's plan had relations with his maidservant Hagar, Ishmael was born. Ishmael is the father of the Arab nations. Ish Islam, by the way, believes that Abraham is their father. In that Abraham went to sacrifice his son Ishmael, not Isaac, on the altar. 
and then it branches off from there. We'll talk more about those differences in future messages. So the blessing for hope is again reestablished through Abraham because who, who comes out of the seed of the Israelites, the Jewish people, the Hebrews? Jesus is born from those folks out of that, that lineage. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 6 and 9, we read this about the blessing for the future. As soon as I find it for us. Galatians 3, 6 through 9 says this, Even so, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Therefore, be sure that it is for those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All nations will be blessed by you. Where did salvation come from? It came through the seed of Abraham. That's the promise. God making provision for us in the midst of our rebellion. Without him, there would be no hope. Without him, there is no love. In the book of 1 John 4, we read these words about the love of God. Some of you might be able to uh, say this by memory, but I'm going to read it just so I don't miss anything. 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Later on in this series, we're going to talk about the different names that people have for God, and is, is, is the God of Israel the same God of Allah, the same God of every other name out there that people... The reality is no, because here it says, if you do not have love, you do not know God, because God is love. Convert or die is not an act of love. God is love. Without Him, there is no love. Listen, the reason I shared that also is the words, word choices. God is love. Not God is about love. Not God tells us about love. Not God commands us to love. But God is love. Meaning the definition of love is God. God loved us so much, He created us. God loved us so much, He made a plan of salvation for us. God loved us so much that He doesn't want us to live in our sins. God is love. So he loved us so much in Romans 5, 8, it says that Christ, God loved us so much and that while we were still in our rebellion, in our sins, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Without God, there is no love. God is the definition of love. Without God, there is no salvation. The provision of salvation is prophesied in the book of Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14. It says these words, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and will bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. And of course, when we read in Luke chapter 2, the nativity story, we read in verse 10 and 11, these words, an angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. For today in the city of David there is born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. The prophecy is fulfilled. Without God there is no love. Without God there is no salvation. And listen, the provision of a Savior is that He is an exclusive Savior. I'm getting ahead of myself. Did you guys get all the notes? I'm not following my own notes. Are you following up there? Good. There's a provision of a Savior, which we read in Isaiah and Luke, and then exclusive Savior. What does it say in Acts 4.12? These words, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must 
be saved. And as, a, as human beings that wonder about fairness and equality and tolerance and all these politically correct world, or words in our world today, we say, wait a minute, that can't be right. What about, and this, is not, this was a discussion I had with, with the same brother. He says, well, what about the people over in this country that no one's told them about God? What about them? They have a sincerity. Or what about the, the people of this nation, the, the, the aborigines, if you will, of this nation that believe in the one great spirit? Now, they don't know about Jesus, perhaps, but they're, they're loving God in their form or their knowledge of him. What about Islam that comes from the seed of Abraham? And they do. And they say there's only one true God and his name is Allah. What about their sincerity? And maybe they don't understand Jesus or they see him only as a prophet, but they're worshiping God, the same God, supposedly, that Abraham worshiped. They'll find out that they don't to their own admission. I can only tell you what the scriptures say. And I believe from Genesis to Revelation, the scriptures are inerrant, are without error, as originally give, given, and they are inspired by the Holy Spirit. They are God-breathed. And it says in the scriptures, there is salvation and no one else. No one else. Because only one person was just enough and holy enough and pure enough to pay for the penalty of the sins of humanity. And that person is Jesus Christ. He is an exclusive Savior in that regard, but he came to save the world. He is not exclusive to just Christians because we don't become Christians until we accept the Savior. He's come for all human beings. But without him, there is no salvation. And without him, without God, there is no justice. In the book of uh, Genesis again, chapter 2, we go back to the very beginning when things began to fall apart. We read this in Genesis 2, verses 15 and 16. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded of the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely. But from the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will die. Meaning you will, have, you will be separated from God. The relationship will be broken because of sin in your life. There was a God of love that created Adam and Eve and gave them everything they could possibly need walked with them on a daily basis and, they just, and told them there's only one tree you're supposed to stay away from. Stay away from it. Don't eat the fruit of that. Because the day you do that, you will be separated from me. There is a justice that will come in your rebellion. It is the first time we see God's justice demonstrated. The reason why there are people that say things like, well, I don't think that Jesus is going to come back in the twinkle of an eye and people are going to be raptured because there'll be too much misery in the world. And God doesn't do that. He doesn't do misery. He doesn't allow misery. A God of love would never allow somebody to be hurt or to have tragedy. Bear in mind, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to die on the cross. Is that not tragic? It turned into triumph. But it pained God and grieved God to see his son go through that. See, we, we have this concept, and it's a man-made concept. By the way, when you're looking, when you're reading blogs, and when you're, and you, and when you're looking at um, different, hearing different thoughts of people, listen to what they say. Find out if they say, well, the Bible says, or find out if they say, well, I feel. Because if they're just going on their feelings, that's not authoritative. 
because my feelings and your feelings can be different. That's why we have the Word of God, the foundation of truth. So we can all go back to the foundation and say, what does it say here? Under the same guidelines of exposition, which a lot of people throw out when they want to prove a point, what does the Scripture say? Scripture says that God is love. He also is just in that love. Justice was established. We see it in Genesis 2. Justice prevails. We see it in the book of Revelation chapter 20, the last book of the Bible. We went through this not that long ago. In Revelation 20, verse 11 and 12, we read these words. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it from, though, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and small, standing before the throne and the books were open and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. What does a judge do except carry out justice? Without God, there'd be no justice. Without God, there would be no peace. Justice was established and justice prevails because of God. And peace for all humanity comes because of God. What did the angels say when they proclaimed that unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord? You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And then a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. Goodwill toward men. They weren't talking about just a global peace, although that comes eventually. They were talking about an inner peace of the heart and soul. Because a Savior has been born. My sins can be forgiven. That all that I have been and all, that I have, all the evil that I have done can be washed away by the blood of the Lamb. And I can live new and transformed in the character of God Himself through the work of the Holy Spirit. There is a peace for all humanity. Without God, there is no peace. There's a peace within. This is one of my favorite verses. I have gone to this verse, I cannot tell you how many times, for myself and for others. It's a verse that I cling to in the book of Philippians, chapter 4. It is one that is not given to us as a means of just making us feel good or in Philippians chapter 4, but it's a verse that has given us of truth, of God's power in our lives on this earth. Philippians chapter 4, be anxious for nothing. In other words, don't worry. Don't fret. Don't, don't let the world overwhelm you. Don't worry about your bills. Don't worry about death. Don't worry about sickness. Don't worry about tragedy. Don't worry about violence. Don't worry about where your next meal's coming from. And I read that and go, wow, that's a pretty big order, God. But what does it say? Be anxious for nothing. For, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving... Let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses and goes way beyond what we could imagine as peace, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Does God promise there that if you're hungry, He'll feed you? Does He promise there that if there's death, that He'll bring that person back to life? Does He promise you if you're sick that you'll be made well every time? No, He doesn't. He says in the midst of that stuff, you can still be at peace inside. I don't diminish the agony of one who grieves or the one that faces health issues. I don't diminish the fact that parents are worried about their kids when they go to war. That spouses worry about their cop spouse when they go out the door on their beat. children go to play sports and parents wonder I hope you know they don't get broken out there I don't deny the fact that we have emotions 
and that we respond in those emotions. But this is going beyond the emotion. Listen, this last week, I truly in my heart grieved when I started reading all these reports of what was going on in the Middle East. The, the pain and the suffering. I often wondered, because I wasn't there, but my dad was, when, when Pearl Harbor was bombed, there was this patriotic swelling where people were going up and people that were too young to go and people that were too old to go were all going to the, to the recruiter's office to sign up and saying, we have got to put this evil to rest now before it comes to our shores. And I always wondered, where did that come from? I mean, what happens inside a person that they would want to, to actually go into harm's way to help protect the innocence of others. We felt a tinge of it at 9-11, but I gotta tell you, in my own personal character, when I saw these little children that were brutalized, and saw pictures of these families that were dying on the rocks of the mountains because they had no water, when I saw these embedded journalist talking to these killers and how happy they were about killing. Something inside me raised up and said, oh, we've got to do something. And we do. But it begins with prayer. Because where our armies can't see, God sees. Where there is suffering and we can't get to help the suffering, God can help. But in the midst of that, we must pray for the peace of Christ to be upon those that are suffering so that they can get through that suffering knowing that God is with them. A peace within. To understand who God is, one must begin with pondering of what would we be missing if he didn't exist. At, one point, at the very first point of my sermon, we wouldn't be missing anything because we wouldn't be here. But without God, there's no hope. Without God, there is no love. There is no salvation. There is no justice. There is no peace. This is the introduction of who God is. I just told you who he isn't or what wouldn't be available if he wasn't there as we have seen the importance of God in the next few weeks, we will ponder the notions of God, the names of God, the nature of God, the necessity of God. I hope you're able to stick with us. There will be one break in there as Luke will be preaching on the 24th. But I, I, God is so good, so awesome. Worship team, you can come forward. I told you the struggles I've been having to come up with sermons now that there's no series. A series, the nice thing about a series is that you know where you're going next week. You're there. And it's like, okay, every, every week it's like, Lord, what do, I, what do you want? This week, as I'm praying, asking God, what do you want? God says, okay, um, I'll tell you, but I'll do it through Kate. And I'll do it through your introduction with your family. The ponderings of God. I am thrilled about this message, this series. But I'm also um, very concerned that I, I say it right, that, that the glory and the, and the majesty and the, the power and the presence, the character, all that God is, we'll, we'll understand to the extent that we can. Because God is much more than we, we, we know. And that's what I want to get across, is he's bigger than you think, and I think. He is mightier than you think, than I think. He is more loving than you think, than I think. He is more just than you think, and I think. We have a little understanding of who God is because the Spirit of God has been placing that understanding in to the point that we can experience it and know it a little bit, but God is so much, so much indescribable, so much greater than all those things. And so I want you to come on back and hang with me and be praying, that pray for me that I'll be able to express this in a manner that glorifies God and 
and that we're able to understand him in a, in a, in a way that is beyond what we've known to this point. That we can appreciate and love him and fear him in a fashion that brings him great glory and honor. Let's stand together as we close with the final song, Our Indescribable God. truly amazing and I pray this week that as we pray and seek you that God that you will reveal to us even in a greater degree who you are that we will surrender to you father all those things that need surrender that we will bless you by how we live our life and that God we will lift you up about all things be glorified in us now and use us for your glory and manifest yourself in us to a greater understanding than we've had before we pray in the mighty name of God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Go in God's peace.